Water Side Economizes a Nash 90.1 2010. It's a subject that will catch a lot of people by surprise and it will impact designs and we need to kind of work our way through this so you can understand how the impact may get you. These are the learning objectives that we hope to accomplish. In a nutshell, you need to understand that ASHRAE 90.1 2010 is going to have a huge impact on waterside design and specifically we, we, we want to look at that application of the heat exchanger in a waterside design situation because it does impact cooling towers and it does impact how you pipe them. And we want to look a little bit at the heat exchanger themselves and some common problems with them as far as fouling and the best way to handle those issues. So here's a detailed outline and when I do a seminar I like to have a good detailed outline so you know where we're going, what we're doing, what you should be learning. So if you've got a few minutes you might look at this later on and you can make sure you understand what we're trying to accomplish. So where do we start? We start with ASHRAE standard 90.1 2010 and the reason we're focusing on this is, is that DOE has looked at that standard and, and it's going to become a state building code October the 18th and there are some major new water side economizer sections in there that most engineers, most owners are not aware of. We're going to look a little bit at the climate zones, a little bit of how to size a cooling tower and what happens. So real quickly, ASHRAE 90.1 2010 is the latest standard from ASHRAE and it has been reviewed by DOE. And here's a, a statement from the ASHRAE headquarters uh, office in DC. ASHRAE has a, a governmental affairs office in DC that communicates with Congress and DOE and all the other people uh, fully staffed all the time. Now the standard was reviewed by DOE and as you can see from the statement, and I think the bullet point is very simple, we've got to save energy. And ASHRAE, had, ASHRAE presented this, DOE reviewed it, and DOE stated that it's going to save 18.5% energy over the previous 2006 version of the standard. So the bottom line is uh, DOE has ruled that every state must have an energy building code in place that equals or exceeds ASHRAE 90.1-2010 by October the 18th, 2013. Yes, a state can ask for an exemption and they can extend it out for a few years, which a lot of states will and they'll update the code on their next routine cycle. To know where you are individually, there's a website at the bottom that you should visit and take a look because it'll tell you where you are, where your state is, where your city is, what standard are you on. And you need to take a look at that to make sure. The bottom line is if, it hit, if it's not already there, it will be shortly and it's certainly good engineer practice to save 18.5% energy. So why would we be focused on water side economizers? Because there are some significant changes here on the water side economizers that engineers are, and designers are just not aware of yet. And, and it's going to hit you pretty quick and we ought to take a time to take a look at it. And the key things I've got in red here, and I think the first one is that for the first time, a design capacity in cooling has been defined. It is the cooling load on a building at 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb and below. In other words, you've got to run your cooling load, take your regular cooling load that you run for your normal design conditions and go back into that cooling load program and plug in 50 degree dry bulb, 45 degree wet bulb for your building. And that will give you the BTU load that you've got to size you want to start economizing on. That's always been a, a confusing thing in the past. What is your number? Where do you want to go? It's been defined. Max pressure drop is 15 feet. There's some other, other comments in there we can play with, but we want to keep playing with the water side a little bit. Here's a little bit more detailed look at, at, at that code or that standard that will become code. Uh, another change is where are the water side economizers required? What part of the country are they required in? And at what BTU level, what are the exemptions? Now you might notice the word fan here. This says minimum fan cooling size for economizers. And you look at it's what, uh, help me out, four and a half tons, 54,000 BTUs. And the only exemptions are climate zones 1A and 1B. There's also an addendum coming for public review that's going to make it even tighter. They're going to be going to non-fan types of designs and requiring some kind of an economizer. But no sense in talking about that yet because it's not here, but the message is it's not going to go away, it's going to get even tighter. So what does this mean to us, this no economizer required 
in zones 1A and 1B, what is a climate zone? What is this exemption all about? Well, here's a climate zone. And DOE has defined for the USA, continental USA, uh, a climate zone chart. And look into the left where it says B, they call that the dry part of the country. Look into the right at A, they call that the moist side of the country. And they've got climate zones labeled. And as you can see, 1A is basically the little pink purple area down there around Florida, which would be Miami. So the message is in the continental USA, the only exemption is that 1A area per DOE's climate zone chart, per the standard, and that's Miami. So basically the whole country has got to deal with this. There's no way around it. And in the past, they didn't. In the past, a lot of parts of the southeast were exempted in the old code. The new code is no longer that way. They determine it will pay back. So now you see the impact changes that are coming impact everything in the whole USA. So why are we looking so hard at water side economizers? What are we talking about here? They're talking about water side economizers and evaporative cooling. Here's a typical little chart, and engineers need to make sure they get this thoroughly understood. We're talking evaporative cooling. Not sensible cooling. We're talking evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is based on the moisture in the air and the amount of moisture that the air can hold. We're going to use a cooling tower. We're going to evaporate water off. And as you evaporate water, the air has to hold that moisture. When you look at cooling tower and ranges, and nominal range is 10 degrees, summertime 95, 85, 78, as you see that summer uh, point on this chart. Take a look at the approach. The approach being how cold a water can you make to the wet bulb. And I'm making 85 degree water in the summer with a 78 degree wet bulb, which gives me a 7 degree approach, 3 GPM per ton, nominally, 10 degree range. That's where we normally pick towers, all over the southeast, all over the country. That's not an unusual condition. In fact, it's kind of the standard nominal condition to pick a tower for CTI. Now, here's the whole point. What happens as you get colder air? What happens as you try to make that colder water that's going to be required for a water side economizer? This is where you need to wake up and take a hard look at this. Cold air holds less moisture. Cold air holds less moisture. That means I take this nominal tower that we picked in the summertime, and I take it down, let's see, we got 7 degree approach at 78. Let's go all the way down to 50 degree wet bulb. Stay on the red line. That red line is 10 degree range full capacity. There was that tower we picked in the summertime at 10 degree range, full capacity, 100% load. If I take the wet bulb down to 50, what happens to my approach? What is the coldest water I can make with 50 degree wet bulb? Look at the chart, and that's pretty close, 62, 63 degree water. So now what? The approach has gone from 7 degrees to what? 12 or 13 degrees. That tower no longer can give you the same close approach it was in hot water. Now the whole point is you need to understand this because it's going to impact the size of your cooling towers. This is so important. I've got a couple more slides to make sure you got this message. Let's take a look at a cooling tower that we picked nominally for 6 degree approach, 79 degree wet bulb, 85 degree cold water, 95 degree hot water, typical summertime condition probably in a city like Atlanta, you know, some, simple as that. So here, here we go, typical, what happens to that tower if I take the water down to 60 degrees going to the cooling tower? How cold a water can I make? In other words, when the water was going to the tower at 95 degrees, I was able to make 85 degree water, 10 degree range, 6 degree approach. What happens to my approach if I try to keep the full load on it as I take the supply water down to 60? Obviously, the outside wet bulbs are going to go down if I got 60 degree water and I'm trying to get a full load out of it. What can I do? Let's take if I got 60 degree supply, I have fixed a tower based on that nominal selection. And I still want full capacity. I want 10 degree range. I want to make 50 degree water, 60 degree hot water to the tower. I want 50 back. I want 100% load. What would be the required approach? 18 degrees? I'd have to have 31.85 degree wet bulb 
to make 100% load correct, and that's not practical. You can't do it. So the whole message is that tower that can work pretty well in the summertime, if you're trying to get 100% load out of it in the wintertime, it will not do it. Take a look at as we take the load down. The next one to the right top is the 75% load, which is 7.5 degree range. The approach now is 12 degrees, and I can give you 52 degree water. Is 52 degree water cold enough to make your water side economizer work? Is 52 degree water cold enough to make that water side economizer work? That's what you got to understand. I've got to have 40 degree wet bulb now. Here's what you need to be thinking. I've got to have 40 degree wet bulb before I turn this thing on. If I got 75% load on it to make it work. Half load, 50% lower left hand side. Half load, I got 60 degree hot water going to the tower. I want to make 55 degree water. I only got half of the tonnage I have picked the tower for in the summertime. What wet bulb can I do that with? 47 degrees. What is my approach? Seven and a half. And on down to 25% load. The message is the tower size may be controlled by the load at 50 degree wet bulb and 45 degree dry bulb. And engineers are not looking at that. We're going to have to relook at our cooling tower cells. We've got to relook at our cooling tower selections at 50 degree wet bulb and 45 degree dry bulb if we've got a water side economizer. It's just kind of strange. One more slide on this because this is hard to get across and I want to make sure you at least leave the seminar thinking about this a little bit. The cold air is dry. I may have to take a look at my nominal summertime cooling tower size at the water side economizer conditions. This is a real simple chart. This might help you a little bit more. I'm still trying to make that 60 degree, uh, uh, I got 60 degree hot water going to the tower and I, I want to make my cold water. My wet bulb is 45 degrees. So I fixed the wet bulb at 45 all the way down, but I'm going to reduce my load. So here's the message out of this that I get too bogged down. I picked a tower for 100% capacity, 900 GPM. Nominal tower was 325 tons. Nominal tower was 325 tons. If you kind of got that message down, what happens if my wet bulb is 45 degrees at the very bottom and I want a 10 degree range? There was a very bottom number would be I want full capacity of 325 tons out of that tower. I can't get it. I cannot get it. I have to pick a nominal 726 ton tower to give you the same BTUs that I was getting at the nominal rating in the summertime in order to get a 45 degree wet bulb and get that range and that approach to get cold water. I'm trying to make 50 degree cold water. Your water side economizers are not going to work too well if you don't get the water down cold. So I'm trying to get down to about 50. So the message again is you need to tell your designers, your engineers need to take a look at what will be the cooling tower size required to meet the load on the building at 50 degree dry bulb, 45 degree wet bulb per the new standard, which has got to be the size of my water side economizer. What size tower do I need? And it might be bigger than the one you pick for the summertime. A little bit weird, but you've got to understand that. Here's a little bit more information on the order side economizer as we go through this. And, and there are a few exceptions on here, and, and I don't have the time to do real deep, but the red point is going to be the one 6.5.1.2.1 design capacity is going to be the one we've got to look at. Again, 100% of the expected system cooling load at the outdoor air temperature of 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb. The exceptions are primarily on data centers or computer, computer room users. A and B, and then C is an exception if you've got a high humidity load that you cannot maintain conditions in the space with a water side economizer. But those are going to be the exceptions. Routinely, you're going to have to do it the way I uh, talked about in the first paragraph. The next paragraph I really want you to look at is the very bottom one. This is different too. This is an addition. This is really going to catch people by surprise. You've got to integrate the economizer control. The economizer system shall be integrated with the mechanical cooling, read it now, read it for yourself, so that the chillers can run at the same time that your water side economizer is running. In effect, this kills parallel water side economizers. They're going to have to be in series, and we'll talk more about that as we go. But read it. Integration means you've got to be able to run the chillers at the same time that you're running 
the water side economizer, and that is huge. And you, this is a big, big change, and a lot of people are really going to get caught off guard with this. The reason for this, as we'll see in a few minutes, is you get more hours of operation. You get to run the system longer. You save more energy. Another quick thing to catch in the new code is that all plate liquid to liquid heat exchangers now have to be ARI certified. No big deal, but it's the message. It needs to be in the specifications, and as you rewrite your specs to meet 90.1-2010, you need to go ahead and stick it in on your plates. They have to be ARI. So what are some other things in 90.1-2010 that relate to the water side economizer that we need to at least be aware of? Now, we said we have to do the load calculations at 50 degree dry bulb, 45 degree wet bulb. Well, those load side calculations have to be done per ASHRAE standard, and you've got a code there to hit. The pump head maybe is another big one some engineers are not aware of yet, and it may catch them off guard. So basically, pump head detail calculations have to be done. Read the last sentence. The pressure drop through each device, each valve, each strainer, each elbow, each T, each cooling coil, each two-way valve, and every pipe segment in the critical circuit, the critical circuit is the one with the highest pressure drop, has to be calculated. And you've got to put it in a set, and you've got to be per the adopting authority. In other words, no longer can you guess at heads. They've got to be calculated and put in the file. Huge, huge change. Good engineers always have done this, but now they're making it mandatory. So how does all this impact the cooling tower, the cooling tower piping? Obviously, we'd like to talk about a lot of other things, but we've got to stay focused on the water side economizer and the piping of it to really get the message across. Now, a couple of things you need to be thinking about. Head pressure control on condenser water for chillers. We've got to look at that because this is potentially going to impact that. We may need a dedicated cooling tower or a dedicated cooling tower cell for the water side economizer. You might have to run two pieces of pipes. Yeah, you might have to run two pieces of pipe out to your towers from your chiller room and back to hit the coat. Uh, look at C. Uh, economized heat exchangers have to be in series, integrated with the condensers. How are we going to do that? We've got to make sure we handle that. And last but not least, we'll look a little bit at three-way valves and verbal speed control on condenser water head pressure control and application. So real quick, where am I going? I have a slide here on her hermetic chillers, whether they be centrifugal or risk reciprocating or screwed machines. I don't care. They all have the same issue. Head pressure control simply means they've got to keep the condenser water temperature or pressure higher than the evaporator side or pressure to make sure in a hermetic machine that the oil keeps flowing from the high side to the low side. You always got to have a deferential pressure or you'll get in trouble. So there's different rules for different machines, and I can't speak for any specific brand. You're going to have to go to your chiller manufacturer, to the one you're using or what you've already owned, and ask them. But you will find on hermetic machines, these are pretty going to be pretty much close to the truth. They don't want water below 60 degrees condenser water to get started. After they're running, they would prefer to get it up to about 75 degrees. If you don't get it up to those temperatures within about 15 minutes, the compressor is going to cut off and not start again for another 30. Pretty serious stuff, right? Head pressure control has to happen. In the new machines, they use two-way valves, or you can use two-way valves and modulate the flow of water through the condenser based on temperature to hold that head pressure up. On the old machines, we had to use three-way valves, and we had to use a bypass. Bottom line is you have to check specifically with your chiller. Even within a brand of chiller, different models can change. There's another way of doing this called open chillers, where your motor is out in the airstream, and there's a coupler and the, an open chiller. These normally can, normally can run at colder water. I can't speak for them but normally can be colder water, but again, we need to keep the high side pressure, high side temperature higher than the cold side to make sure everything still works good. Verify with your chiller manufacturer. But think about this. We're saying, on a, even on an open machine, we're saying we probably don't want water from the cooling tower any colder than 55. 
What do you want on your water side economizer? You want the water as cold as you can get. Start thinking about that a little bit. Let's see what this all means. So let's look at the new chillers, for example. This is buying a new one. I about all of them can do this. I can't speak for specific brands, but they all can probably do this. Look at the head pressure control, and they will allow you to use a two-way modulating valve in the condenser water piping and modulate the flow to hold temperature. They actually sense the temperature of the refrigerant in that condenser head pressure, and they modulate the valve to hold that number to whatever it's set for that machine. Works fine, but you're varying the flow through the condenser. And you might need to take a little deeper look at that. In fact, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. One little sidebar here for you guys really in this business. If you've got a great big old concrete sump, a big remote sump out there full of cold water, and you're trying to start a chiller up, you may not be able to get it started unless you've got a two-way valve. You may have to have a two-way modulating valve just to get it up and running. So head pressure control is for real, and you've got to deal with it and two-way valves is probably the way to go on it for the time being. Now, what, what has all this got to do and how does it all kind of tie together? Another section of the code is going to tie in with this and you see where pipe sizing. And, and very simple is the code now states in red, condenser water piping shall be designed flow rate wise and pipe size based on the following table. We'll show you the table next. Modulating two-way control valves, and of course, you see all the all the exceptions there. But really, look at this. Here's the table. This is in ASHRAE 90.1, 2010, and I guarantee you, a lot of designers don't even know it's in there. Haven't even looked at it yet. And it's going to be code October the 18th, 2013, or the required code as soon as the state adopts everything. This gives you the design max flow rate based on the pipe size, and look at the top. Verbal flow through the condensers, or verbal speed, and the hours of operation. So the left-hand chart, other is pretty much constant flow, by the way. Other is pretty much constant flow. But if you're less than 2,000 hours, you see the pipe size and the max flow. If you're over 4,000 hours, you see the max flow. It's a pretty straightforward chart that you've got to deal with. So you need to make people aware of this. So let's come back to coolant tower piping now. So the reason I brought the pipe sizing in, because it needs to be talked about because nobody's really paying attention to it yet. Let's go back to that coolant tower pipe. I said to you I might need two different coolant tower cold water supply temperatures. Water side economizers want water where? As cold as you can get it. That's the whole reason you're doing it. But the chillers want it where? At some elevated temperature for head pressure control. So which is it? Which temperature are you going to control to? So you might need two supply and return connections to the towers to give you chiller's head pressure control and to give you the coldest water you need for your water side economizer. Remember, they have to be integrated. Integration means you've got to run the chillers or be able to at the same time that you're running the water side economizers. The two have to go hand in hand. So let's take a quick look at that. Let's see if we can kind of understand the piping and what the impact might be on the piping because, again, this is, these are issues people have really not had to deal with before. This is new. This is new things that are coming. Here's a typical three-cell cooling tower chiller operation with three condensers that I've added a water side economizer to. Now, you see the three-way valve will bypass the bottom chiller, the bottom condenser, and the water will go through the play heat exchanger for the water side economizer. Now ask yourself the question, how cold a water do you want when that chiller's running? I mean, when that chiller's off, excuse me, and the water side economizer's running. How cold a water do you want? As cold as you can get. Notice I have a separate pipe and a separate pump and a dedicated tower, a dedicated cell to that particular chiller and plate. So on the bottom chiller and plate, we would run one or the other. We'd run the play heat exchanger or we'd run the chiller. And we got its own separate dedicated tower, so we make the water as cold as that tower will give you. The top two chillers are together, and the only other two cells, and they're in parallel, they're working together with one set of pipes out to the two cooling towers and back, and those would be running at 60, 70, 75 degree condenser water, whatever the water temperature I need to maintain head pressures on the condensers. So now the top two chillers could be running at the same time 
I'm running the water side economizer at the bottom. And I've got two different supply water temperatures coming from my towers. I've got a dedicated cell with cold, cold water from a plate. I've got two cells available from my top two chillers. I have integrated. I've integrated the water side economizers in with the chillers and using two pipes. I think you kind of see the message here and how this might be a dramatic change to people and how they pipe. Now, another way you might approach the same issue would be one set of pipes out to the towers like we've always traditionally done. We've always done it with one set. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying this is how we normally would do things. What have I done here? Notice I've added a two-way valve to every, con every chiller. I got a two-way valve on the plate heat exchanger simply so I can valve it on and off. But now I've got one set of pipes in the towers and one set of pipes back. Now, if my water side economizer is running, what do I want to do? I want to make as cold as water as I possibly can to make that water side economizer work. If I'm going to make 50 degree water going to the plate heat exchanger or 48 degree water going to the plate heat exchanger, what am I, what are my chillers going to do? I've got to have a two-way modulating valve on my chillers on the condenser water side to maintain head pressure. Otherwise, they're going to cut off and not run. So the only way to make these chillers run and integrate with the water side economizer is to add two-way modulating valves on the chillers, modulate that cold water back so we don't have full flow. We're varying the flow through the condensers. We are varying the flow through the condensers to maintain some head pressure number to make sure they stay on line. And my real question to you here, you better check with your chiller manufacturers, number one, to make sure this is okay. It's probably okay for startup. Is it okay to run a chiller continuously with variable flow through the condenser? continuously, not just start up. Is it okay to keep running that way anytime you're trying to integrate the two? I can't answer that question. You're going to have to ask the question. And another comment would be, if you're running the water temperature down to 45 degrees and holding it back with a two-way valve to get the temperature up, that's not going to be as efficient as it would be to split it. Because I think you're going to have an argument that it'd be more energy efficient to have a dedicated cell for the plate running as cold as you can get it and you have two other cells for the chillers running hotter because it's cheaper to make hotter water. In other words, it costs you money to make colder water. Your, your fans have to run at full speed and so forth. So it gets a little bit tricky, but those are the two things you've got to look at. You've got to make some choices here, but don't forget head pressure control. So let's take, keep taking a look at this economizer heat exchanger in series integrated with a chiller plant. What does that mean? How do you control those? And I'm making a statement to you. Parallel piping of the water side economizer, for all practical purposes, is dead. It's gone. Oh, with gone. And that's what everybody's been doing. This is what's going to shock people when you make that kind of statement and you start thinking about it. Let's see why. So here we go. Where we think it's going to go to be integrated. What we're saying to you is we believe that the water side economizer, the heat exchanger, is going to have to be piped in series with the plant. This is the chilled water side. This is the cold water side of the plant now. We're not looking at condenser water. Look at the evaporator side, the chill water side. So what we're looking at with the plate is taking that return water, 58, 59 degree water coming back, whatever it may be from the cooling coils, and we're going to do some cooling on it. In other words, we're not going to have full capacity here but we're going to be able to cool from 58 to 56. So now when it gets to the chillers, the chillers will finish it off to 45 or whatever the numbers are. And we'll look at a specific example in just a few minutes. But the message is I'm going to do some pre-cooling of the hot return chill water before I deliver the hot return chill water back to the chiller plant. And if I pre-cool it, I take the tonnage off the chillers, KW goes down, and I save money. I've integrated the other beautiful thing about it is with a water side economizer integrated and on the return water, it's a lot easier to make 56 degree water from 59 than to try to make 45. And if you put them in parallel, you've got to have that cold water. In other words, I'll get a lot more hours of operation because I'm dealing with hotter water. I'm in series with the plant. I don't have to cool it all the way down. I'm just pre-cooling. I'm not trying to do all the cooling. So I can operate 56, 55. I can operate much hotter return waters, and I get many, many more hours of operation out of my cooling towers 
than I would if I had piped it otherwise. That's right. ASHRAE is pushing integration. And we'll keep talking about integration a little bit more in a minute. Let's just keep make, making sure we stay on the same subject so we don't lose you. So what does it mean when you put them in series and why? I kind of told you this, but let's just quickly review it. Because I think it's important you understand this so you can explain it to people. And if you're an engineer, you understand why you've been asked to do something different than you've been doing all your life. Very simple. By putting them in series and integration, you get more operating hours. The economizer reduces return water temperature of the chiller plant. You get a much faster payback. Bottom line, you save more energy. It will operate at a higher wet bulb temperature than economizes pipe in parallel. In parallel, you have to get in a lot colder wet bulb before you can turn them on. It may require two different cooling tower cold water supply temperatures, as we talked about earlier. Economizes light cold water. Caution you on the chiller side. You can create some short cycling of your chillers if your controls are not set up properly. And we're going to review that in detail next. But basically, we're reducing the load to the chillers, but we haven't reduced flow rate. And we very well may get to where the chillers are really lightly loaded and then may short cycle on you. Uh, last statement is pretty good statement, and you're going to see a lot more from Ashry on this. You need to be looking at can you, can you in the wintertime, can you off peak load, can you raise your supply to your order temperatures? And of course, the limitation there is going to be can you maintain the mid to control? Can you raise supply to your order temperatures in the wintertime? And you've got to make sure you don't get beyond where you need to be to maintain humidity. If you can, every time you go up and supply chill water temperature, guess what? We get more hours of operation on the water side economizer. We get more free cooling. Make a little sense to you, I hope. So let's take a little bit further with this integration thing. We're talking about that same code, still on water side economizers. We haven't left the issue. We're going to stay with it. Quote in red, economizer systems shall be integrated with the mechanical cooling system so that the chiller's mechanical cooling can run at the same time. So here we go back with the uh, parallel, the way it's been done a lot now. This is what I'm telling you is probably for all practical purposes dead. They say you can't use it, but it's not going to be integrated. So let's take a look. This is traditional way on the chill water side, chill water side, that we pipe the plates in. And the plate was in parallel with the chillers. It was in parallel with, parallel with the evaporators. So now that play heat exchanger has to make colder water. In other words, if you're going to swing over to the plate and your design temperature is 45 and you need 45 to maintain the humidity control, you've got to make sure your plate makes 45. If you're going to make 45 degree water, how cold a wet bulb you got to have? 38, 39? I mean, you really got to get down. So the message is you're really limiting the hours of operation for your water side economizer when it's piped in parallel. That's why Ashley says, no, 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 not going to do that anymore. We're going to go in series because we get more hours of operation. We get a better payback. We save more energy. I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you because you're not going to see this done this way any longer. It's really going to become integrated. So let's take, take a little issue at this short cycling issue. Make sure you understand it because we picked up on this from California, where it's, this has been practiced for quite a while. And this is some of the issues they got when they first started putting them in. So we might as well learn and, and make sure we at least anticipate this problem and we can handle it. You need to keep in mind the minimum load required on your chiller to keep it from short cycle. If you've got a chiller, is that minimum load 15%, 20%? What is that number to make sure your chiller will stay online efficiently and not short cycle? Uh, when you do integration, you may have multiple chillers running at very low loads because the economizer is going to gradually reduce the return water temperature going to the chiller plant, and that's going to reduce the load on the chillers even though the flow stays the same. Now, I've got an actual example coming up that we're going to walk through where I think you'll understand this. The major reason is this is a practical problem that people walk into when they integrate the two together. We want to make sure at least we define the problem and people begin to think about it. Let's take a traditional chiller plant, three chillers, on the chill water side with a system load of 1,000 tons. Okay, the design supply chill water is 45 degrees. Everybody see that? The return is at 57. And we want to see what happens when we turn this plant on. So basically, here we go. 
you've got three chillers running, you got the you got a thousand ton load on it. Each chiller is two thirds of sixty six percent loaded. So let's just make sure we don't lose you. There is no water side economizer here. This chiller plant has the capability of producing three thousand GPM at forty five degree water. Has it, and that water for per design would be coming back at fifty seven degrees three thousand GPM at a full loaded situation. We've taken a snapshot of this chiller plant. It's three 500-ton chillers, just so you got numbers in your head, three 500-ton chillers at 12 degrees delta T, and 12 degree delta T is 2 GPM per ton. 500 tons, 12 degree delta T is 2 GPM per ton on the chill water side. So at 3,000 GPM, 45 degrees supply, I've got the capability of producing, producing 500 tons each, or 1,500 tons total, when I'm at 45 degree supply and 57 degree return. Everybody got it? Well, right now I'm two thirds loaded. I have no water side economizer. I'm taking out 2,000 GPM. I got verbal flow on my evaporator side. I got primary, secondary, constant flow on my chillers, verbal flow on the secondary, and I and I got 2,000 GPM of 45 degree water going out, 2,000 GPM of 57 degree water coming back. So I got a 12 degree delta T on my load. I got 2,000 GPM, and that's a thousand ton load. Everybody got it? We got a thousand ton load. So I bring back 2,000 GPM, 57 degrees at the bottom T where the common pipe is, and I mix that with a thousand GPM of 45 degree water to give me a return temperature to all three chillers running, 3,000 GPM, 53 degrees. So each chiller is seeing 53 degree return. 45 degree supply, 8 degree delta T, design is 12 degrees, 8 twelfths is 2 thirds loaded. There you go. Each, each, each chiller is 2 thirds or 66 percent loaded. What would happen to this chiller plant is this exact situation if I added a water side economizer and I've integrated it with a chiller plant, what would happen? That's the question. Let's take a look. I've added a water side economizer. I put it on the return. I've integrated it with the chiller plant per the new code. Notice my system load is still a thousand tons. All three chillers are still running. I'm making 45 degree water, 3,000 GPM of it. I'm taking 2,000 GPM of 45 degree water out to my building. I'm coming back 2,000 GPM at 57 degrees. I still got that thousand ton load, but what's happening now? I turn on the water side economizer. I take that 2,000 GPM out at 57 degrees and I put it back at 54. I'm taking 250 tons off my chiller plant with my water side economizer. Free cooling, that's beautiful. I've integrated it. I've got the return temperature back down to 54 degrees. Everybody see what's happening? So that water side economizer is working. And I'm making 54 degree water and I can do that with probably 50 degree wet bulb, a lot higher temperatures. I've got my water side economizer turned on real early. I don't have to wait for real cold temperatures to get it running. What's happening to my chillers? Go over to my chillers. I've got a thousand GPM of 45 degree water in the blue coming south, mixing with 2000 GPM of 54 degree water to give me 3000 GPM of 51 degree water going to my chillers. So what are you seeing? Each chiller now has got 51 degree water producing 45. Each chiller has got what a 6 degree delta T. Design was 12. So what are you seeing? Each chiller is now half loaded. Each chiller is now 50% loaded. You got it? But the total load on the building hasn't changed. It was 1,000 tons, but we took 250 tons of it off with a water side economizer. I think you kind of get the message here. Let's take this one more step, and I think you'll begin to see what's happening. Here's the next step. I jumped up the water side economizer to produce 750 tons. The total building load is 1,000 tons. The chillers are still making, what, 3,000 GPM, 45 degree water. I'm still taking out to my building 2,000 GPM, 45 degree water. My load is still 1,000 tons. But now I've got my water side economizer taking out what? 750 tons of free cooling. Isn't that beautiful? How'd I do that? I just cool the return water from 57 to 48. I'm returning, I'm cooling the return chill water from 57 to 48. I'm going to now give the chill plant back 2,000 GPM at 48 degree water. Wow. Load on the building hadn't changed. Total flow rate of 2,000 GPM has not changed. 
But now what's happening? I got 1,000 GPM of 45 degree water mixing with 2,000 GPM of 48 to give me 3,000 GPM of 47 degree water going back to my chillers. What's happened now? Looks to me like the delta T on each chiller is 2 degrees. Looks to me like the sign was 12. 2 twelfths is 1 six. Each chiller is 17% loaded. You're going to start having cycle problems. Chillers are going to start surging on you. They're going to fall offline. In other words, your control setup for the chillers has to handle this. And one of the first things somebody says, why don't you turn a chiller off? Okay, I'll turn a chiller off right here, and I'd be okay. What, if I, what happens if I turn two chillers off? I would lose supply chill water temperature. So we don't have time to dig real deep into that, except you've got to understand that as the water side economizer reduces the return chill water temperature to the chiller plant, the flow requirements from the chiller plant have not changed. Therefore, you're going to have some short cycle issues if you don't do your controls right. We'll be happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it later on. There's some ways to handle this, but just be aware the problem exists and you may have to deal with it. So where, let's go back to uh, overall piping and the free cooling and kind of take a look at condensed water side a little bit further. How do you pipe these in? What's traditional? And here we go with the integration of the chill water plant. Take a quick look at this overall view. And all I'm trying to get across to you is a change. In this situation, we've got a dedicated tower for the water side economizer and heat exchanger, which is upstream of the chill plant. We're, we're, we're cooling the return chill water. We've integrated in this slide the water side economizer with the chill plant so we'd run both. And we've got two sets of pipes out to a cooling towers. Two sets of pipes. I think that's probably the way it's going to go. You don't have to go that way, but I think you're going to see a lot more of this. So far, that's what we're seeing a lot of. And I think you need to be aware of that coming. Let's look at a little bit this heat exchanger side. Let's take a little deeper look at heat transfer so we understand it. What, what are the basic principles of heat transfer involved here? What kind of heat exchanger should we look at? How should they be piped? Why am I bringing up solids and phthalate? How about the house operation and sequence? How do you control? And let's just take a quick look at this. So what is basic heat transfer is all about? I don't care if you're talking about a cooling coil, a heating coil, chill water, hot water, or a heat exchanger. In this case, we're specifically looking at heat exchangers. You've got this QBTs per hour, which is equal to U, or the heat transfer coefficient, times the area, times the LMTD. This is kind of like the temperature deferential. We've got the log mean. But that's the formula, if you're a heat transfer engineer, that you have to use. It's the same formula you have to use to calculate cooling load through a wall. It's the same formula. But we're looking at it from the standpoint of heat transfer on a heat exchanger. So what is this U factor all about? This is the, this is the U factor that we want to look at real quick, and we're going to pick a heat exchanger. We want the most efficient heat exchanger you can get. We want the highest U factor you can get. The higher the U factor, the smaller the heat exchanger. The lower the first cost, the more efficient it is. What impacts a U factor? We've well, got the FEM coefficients, which is you know, what is on the film of the surface. Do you have uh, turbulence or laminar flow? You've got the material resistance. You've got coefficients. And you've got filing. You put all this together, you've got some kind of a heat exchanger pattern you're going to come up with. This is a typical plate. And the whole idea behind the plate heat exchanger is high turbulence. Uh, to get the U-factors up, you can get some extremely high U-factors on a plate heat exchanger when you create turbulence with these different types of plate designs. That's the whole concept. So what we're trying to do specifically with a plate or any heat exchanger, we want to maximize that U factor because it reduces the area down, reduces the first cost down, and makes it affordable. And that's the thing we're looking for is the highest U factor we can possibly get so we can come up with the most economical selection of a heat exchanger. Typical U factor on a plate can be as high as a thousand, and it's not uncommon to see those kind of numbers. But there's another approach available to you on what is out economists. You can go to single pass series counterflow heat exchangers. And we're going to find in a few minutes what single pass counterflow means for all types of heat exchangers. But in essence, you want the coldest water with the coldest on, on each side. And you want to make sure that you've got it single pass counterflow. The advantage of these is they're a lot easier to clean. We'll kind of comment on that as we go. Some changes on, uh, if you haven't looked at heat exchangers lately, whether they're chillers, evaporators, or single pass counterflow like we're talking about, the old designs were just standard copper tubing. The new designs are enhanced tubes. 
and it's just spiral tubes, very simple. But what you're doing, you're creating some turbulence in there. You get a little more surface area out of it, and you're creating some turbulence to break up the inside film coefficients. You're breaking up the inside film coefficients, which essence increases you, which means you can get away with more BTUs to smaller surface area. So what does series counter flow mean for enhanced tubes or really play heat exchange is the same story. Uh, you see the U factor impact by going to enhanced tubes. And what you see on the plot on the left hand side is, is a U factor. And what you see on across the bottom is just the flow. But look at the U factors themselves. Typical shelling tubes are lower number by enhancing the tubes and you saw what enhancement means, you can increase the U factors two to three times. So now single pass counter flow heat exchangers become practical on a water side economizer where you want real close approaches. So on a single pass counter flow heat exchanger, four degrees is reasonable. And the reason people are looking at these again is they're cleanable, you can get marine water boxes on them, they're easy to design, and they're very flexible where you put them. So let's go a little bit further with heat transfer. Hear people talking about lambda flow and turbulent flow. Hear people saying pick your coils always be turbulent. Pretty much a true factor. What do they mean? It's a simple little picture of it, but lambda flow in a tube, a pipe, or a cooling coil, or a heating coil simply means the flow, as you see at the top chart, it's just nice and smooth, just going down the pipe nice and easy. There's no turbulence to break up the inside film coefficient. What you want to do at the bottom with that turbulent flow is you want little eddies working along the surface areas of the tubes to break up the film coefficient. Because if you can break up the film coefficient, you can dramatically increase the U factors. Dramatically increase the U factors by having that. So what does that mean in temperature cross and approach? Let's take a quick look and try to educate everybody real simple, not trying to make heat transfer experts out of you, but if you're going to do water side economizers, you need to grasp some of this because you have to pipe them accordingly. You put them in, you've got to pipe your plates or your straight tube heat exchangers accordingly. So what is a temperature cross? What does it mean for a plate or a single pass heat exchanger? What is approach? What does it mean? Look, I'm working a cooling tower. I'm trying to make uh, 52 degree water out of 49 degree wet mud. I'm trying to give you 49 degree cooling tile water to the heat exchanger to give you 52 degree water and chill water side. I'm trying to get a tight approach. That would be a three degree approach. So the message is I want to make as cold a water as I possibly can from water side economizer. And the limitation of that is how cold a water can I make my cooling tower? How cold a water can my cooling tower give me? And how close to that cooling tile temperature can I make water? Can I make chill water using a heat exchanger of some kind? How close? That's the approach. And what we want is the tightest we can get. So what's reasonable? Uh, you can pick plates, but probably two degrees, pretty reasonable, clean. You can pick single pass counter flows probably for four. My chart here shows three. So what does temperature cross mean? Temperature cross means what? Take a look. I got my coldest water on both sides together and my hottest water together. In other words, look at the flow errors. My, I, I, I'm going to operate as a chill water uh, heat exchanger for a second. I got 57 degree T1 return chill water temperature going in my heat exchanger. And going out of my heat exchanger, I've got cooling tower water going out, say, at 52 degrees. Everybody see that? So I've got a temperature cross going on. What am I trying to make? I'm trying to make 45 degree water, which is T2. To make 45 degree water, I've got to have colder water. Come on. So that's going to be my coldest water for my tower at 42 degrees. I'm making 45 degree leaving water. That's a three degree approach on the 42 degree water I'm making. On the other side, I've got a 7 degree temperature cross. In other words, I'm making colder water than I'm taking back out. I'm making what? 45 degree water on the, on the chill water side. On my condensed water side, I am sending back to the tower 52. You see that? That's a 7 degree temperature cross. That is only technically possible single flow, counter flow. And you can see the flow arrows in different directions. And that's the, what we mean by temperature cross and approach. That's why you've got to have single pass counter flow in order to have a temperature cross. Very simple, but you've got to understand it because when you go to pipe your heat exchangers, wake up. You've got to pipe them accordingly or they won't work. You've got to pipe them up in a temperature cross, single pass counter flow situation or they won't work. So make sure you understand why this is important. 
So we've been playing around with plates at 75 that work quite well. We've also been playing around with single tube counterflow heat exchangers for probably 25 or 30 years as well, and they work quite well. Uh, we want to look a little bit real quick, quickly at fouling, and it's a subject that people don't talk about enough because, uh, very simple, you're dealing with cooling tower water, and in the air you got all kinds of stuff. Why is this important? It's a typical uh, clearance marked with a little red arrow here of a typical plate. As you can see, it's pretty tight. Uh, 0.16 inches in on a typical plate heat exchanger. So for all practical purposes, and this is an IONM from plate manufacturers. We went through and looked at a whole bunch of them, and all of them have the same information, identical in IONM. It says very simple. Uh, we've got thin wall heat exchangers, high heat flows, but it can be seriously reduced if we get deposits. And we're telling you, you've got to do maintenance. If you're going to do maintenance, fine. But you need to have a pretty clean system. You need to do maintenance on the heat exchangers to make sure we don't foul them up. That's just what the IONM is saying. And we find, unfortunately, a lot of heat exchangers on water side economizers that the maintenance people have just simply turned off and bypassed because they're foul and they don't want to do the maintenance. Now, as designers, we want to save the energy. We want to do the right thing here. And the right thing is to get them cleaned up. And that way, we don't turn them off. So what are we getting at? Here, here's what happens when you file a heat exchanger. This is pretty typical, whether it's a chiller, evaporator, or, uh, a plate, or a single pass get up. It doesn't matter. It, as you file a heat exchanger, your efficiencies go way down. Your power required go way down. In other words, your efficiency of the heat exchanger just deteriorates rapidly. And we obviously want to keep them clean, because keeping them clean, we've got that efficiency in place. Pretty picture, huh? A uh, typical plate that we see sometimes with no maintenance being done and no system to keep them clean. I if you're going to put in a heat exchanger like this, uh, it's not going to last long. You're not doing your job. Don't get mad at me, but you're really, really not paying attention to the real world. Uh, here's the real world for you. Here's a typical picture of a job site in uh, a couple cooling towers. Uh, basically, the paving's been done. The general contractor want to turn the building on and dry it out. How many times have we heard that comment? So where do you think all that red clay is going to go if there's any kind of wind going on if we turn on the tower? To make a long story short, you see what happens. So the message is anything in the air in a cooling tower is going to wind up in the stump of the tower. And this is to the extreme, I know, but I'm trying to drive a point home to you. Uh, you see what happened to the plates on the job site? They immediately got filed. Uh, so basically, here's a general statement for you, and pretty much ASHRAE pretty much, well, if you dig into it, we're kind of making the same kind of comment. It's pretty much essential in every cooling tower operation that you clean it up, that, that, that you've got an open cooling tower. You need either centrifugal separators or sand filters. Pick your choice. We don't care, but you need to do the maintenance on those open systems and to keep them clean and particularly with water side economizers, because if you don't, they're not going to work. So the message of the seminar is, if you're going to spend the money, you're going to spend the time to do a water side economizer, which by code you're going to have to do, don't we owe it to the owner? Don't we owe it to, 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 to the people involved to make sure they work and their maintenance situations can be handled? Please consider putting separators, sand, centrifugal, whatever you want, to clean those systems up so we don't get problems. Here's a typical example of a little water side uh, uh, cleanup where we're using the basing of the tower, a little sweeper type system to keep it clean. No big deal. Here's what it looks like. We even recommend that you in your guide specifications on all cooling towers that you get the factories to install these little uh, piping systems for cleaning in the basins. You don't have to buy the sand filter now. You don't have to buy the centrifugal separator now. But get the sweeper systems in the basings of those towers so when the time comes somebody has a maintenance issue or somebody has the money, if they don't have the money up front, they can go ahead and get this done because this is critical to making these things work. Why would we spend the money if we're not going to make them work? That's kind of the question. So another comment on a single pass heat exchanger, and you may want to take a look at this based on what we're seeing. They do handle fouling better. You can only get about a four degree approach versus the plate at two, but the plates foul a lot quicker. And once you foul a plate, you're going to lose efficiency. You may find that single pass counter flow heat exchangers save you more money and reduce your maintenance costs. It's certainly a good option to take a look at. Let's go back to the water side economizers. 
What is the design procedure we're going to go through to pick these water side economizers? And this is something every engineer, every designer is going to have to deal with. So why don't we just start taking a quick look at this and try maybe we can get a little guideline how to do it. First of all, you're going to have to calculate your cooling load at 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb for your building. You're going to have to make the decision whether you go series or parallel. We're basically stating that parallel for all practical purposes, is dead. Series or integration is the way it's going to go. We need to look at cooling tower piping. We're going to have two pipes out of towers. We're going to have it back. What are we, what are we going to do? Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Somebody's got to make that decision because that decision is critical with head pressure control, critical with having cold water to your water side economizer. Do we have a dedicated cell for the economizer? Your, your decision, but don't ignore it. What is the required chill water supply temperature? Why are we asking that? You got the BTUs. What is the required chill water supply temperature? You got to calculate the approach. Approach of the cooling tower, water coming to your heat exchanger, and temperature you need, because that may size. You got to have that size your heat exchanger, and you're going to have to check your cooling tower size. Will your dedicated cooling tower cell be big enough to cool? provide the BTUs for that building at 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb. And that's where you select your heat exchanger and you've got to double check your cooling tower size. And people are not used to doing that. And what control sequence will we use? Well, given your control sequence, in the essence of the schedule we have for this seminar, we don't really have time to dig through this. This is pretty basic. Uh, what we find, this is being done. This is actual sequence we got from an engineering friend of ours. He's been doing it for years. We have permission to use it and give it to you. It works. The interesting thing you should get is this, that on the water side integration system, he is getting free cooling at very hot temperatures. In other words, he's able to switch it over at 55 degree wet bulb and start getting cooling. He's able to turn it on at 55 degree wet bulb, integrate the water side economizer into his chill plant and start getting free cool. Now you might have to adjust that number a little bit based on where you are and what your chill water supply temperatures that you need are, but this sequence works pretty good. It gives you a place to start, take a look at it. This is based on two different temperatures, by the way. Here's a typical water side economizer selection for a heat exchanger, and you see the numbers involved and for a cooling tower, just to give you some numbers, but the message is here, we picked the cooling tower for summertime conditions, but now we got to go over to the wintertime. Got to go to the wintertime and check to see if it's big enough. And this is what we did here. This is one that's been picked for the summertime at 95 degrees, 78 degree wet bulb. We're making 83 degree cold water, 12 degree range. And what we got to do is take the BTUs required for economizer, run over to those temperatures and see what we can make out of it. Pretty simple, but the message is we've got to double check our cooling tower size, we pick it for the summertime condition, yes, but if you're going to have a dedicated cell or however you're going to handle it, you've got to go over and look at that wintertime load condition to see if you can handle it. If not, you may have to actually increase the size of your tower or have more cells dedicated to the water side economist. Uh, another little quick comment, and I think this drives the point home to you, go look at your bins. This happens to be uh, Raleigh Durham Airport, but all I'm after is for you to look at temperature bins. And all this is is a chart showing you how many hours out of the year that the wet bulb is below 50 degrees. And in this particular case, you see we started at 49 degree wet bulb, one degree below 50, and we got 3,487 hours that were below 50 degree wet bulb. And when you integrate, we can run this tower 3,400 hours a year at 50 degree wet bulb or below and do some pre-cooling when we integrate the towers. Now if you were trying to do a water side economizer parallel, you'd have to get a lot colder wet bulb before you turn it on. You have a lot less hours of operation to work with. Another reason for showing you this, if you want to calculate the energy savings available to you, then now you've got a way to get there. You can come here and look at the hours of operation before the wet bulb temperature you turn on your water side economizer. You can match that up with your tower. You can come up with the BTU savings if you've got a cooling load profile for your building that you're getting out of your water side economizer. might be a great thing to do for lead, 
great thing to do to calculate and justify the water side economizer payback. Typical little chart for picking your water side economizer, and we don't have a time to go in detail. We're just giving it to you if you're interested in taking a look to come up with your payback on your investment. All we're saying is if you go through this procedure, you can come up with the anticipated energy savings for doing a water side economizer. And obviously, integrating them saves a lot more, and it's becoming code, so obviously it has to be done. It does make sense. Kind of last but not least as we go through this, I want to go back to what we're seeing in a marketplace with this integration. And what we're seeing is a dedicated sale to the water side economizer. We're seeing heat exchangers in the position of being in series with the chiller plant to where we can pre-cool the 58 degree water going to the chiller plant, the 55, 54, take some load off the chiller plant. And we're seeing a dedicated sale of colder water to the water side economizer two pipes out to a towers and back, another set of sales to the traditional chillers so they can run at the same time. You can do it any way you want to, but this is what we're seeing. This is kind of probably going to become the design. The message is this way you can maintain your head pressure control, you can keep the temperatures elevated on the chillers that are running, and you can have as cold a water as you need for your water side economizers. So the message real simple is pay attention to this. If you don't want to do this, okay, but you've got to find a way to handle the head pressure control. So to summarize what we've been just kind of going through is 90.1-2010 has some huge changes in water side economizers that most people are not aware. And I think we need to slow down a little bit at a high level make sure people are aware of what's coming. DOE has ruled that every state must have a building code October the 18th, 2013. That's this year. Equal to this code or better. Your state can ask for an exemption, can ask to, de to delay it two or three years. They can do that. You go to that website and find out where they are. But it's coming. And I think engineers want to do the right thing. I think saving 18.5% energy is the right thing. I think most engineering firms are going to go ahead and make this move now. It just makes good sense. The cooling load is defined for the first time. It's the cooling load on your building. It's 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb. Very easy to run. Run your cooling loads and get it. You must integrate the water side economizer with the chillers. Real simple. You have to be able to run the water side economizer at the same time that you're running your chillers. That's what an integration means. Look out for short cycling. We went through it. It's easy to handle, but don't get caught off guard by not understanding that as you download or pre-cool the water going to your chiller plant, you'll take a load off the chillers and you may have to do something to make sure you don't short cycle chillers. Play heat exchangers can foul. Uh, if, you're, if you're going to put them in, clean them. Put a system in to clean them. You may also want to look at a series counter flow heat exchanger, single pass, that's a lot easier to clean. And a, a lot of people are making that move because they find them easier to maintain saving dollars. Last but not least, you've got to check your cooling tower selection. This really bothers people. You've got to check your cooling tower selections in cold weather. You can't just look at 95, 85, 70 degree wet bulb. You've got to look at your cooling tower selections where? 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb. What will your cooling towers do? That's a change and we need to drive that point to people. Uh, we appreciate your time. I hope you get something out of this. I think we're pretty much on the schedule that we promised. This is a huge issue. I hope you guys will go out and talk to people and try to help us educate it. It's the right thing to do, saving energy. Have a great day.